Welcome to Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykanst, Superintendent of Schools. Substance use and abuse is a reality in our community and, and sometimes in our schools. Joining me today for a conversation about what we are doing in the town and the schools to collaborate to prevent youth substance abuse are several folks I'd like to introduce. Uh, first of all, Tom Denton, uh, Needham Public Schools Director of Guidance, John Madelman, uh, Needham Youth Services Director, Carol Reed from the Health Department, who also uh, leads our Needham Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, Tim McDonald, the Director of uh, Needham Public Health, uh, Kathy Pinkham, our Director of Wellness, and also we have two students, Mark Walker and uh, Nicole Luca, who are both members and leaders in SALSA. Nicole, what's SALSA? Um, SALSA stands for Students Advocating for Life Without Substance Abuse. And it's a club at the high school that focuses on substance prevention. And we go to Pollard to the eighth graders. And we talk about um, drugs and alcohol and reasons to say no and ways to say no when anyone tries to peer pressure you into doing um, certain things you don't want, like drugs or alcohol. Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit more about the work that you're doing in our schools, so thank you for explaining that. You know, I thought I, I'd begin with the big picture, uh, perhaps, Tim, as, as the Director of uh, Public Health, sharing with us uh, what's going on in our community and, and in our schools. We, we gather a lot of data. I know that uh, Carol does as well, and in your work. Uh, recently, we conducted a Metro West survey uh, that shared information about what our students perceive are, are some of the issues. What were some of the results about substance use uh, in the community in the schools? So th there's a number of um, pieces of information. We're very lucky as a community to be part of the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey, which has been administered every other fall by the Metro West Health Foundation. Uh, and it's a detailed survey that uh, focuses on middle school and high school and looks at everything from uh, substance use, stress, mental health, uh, sleep, nutrition, dating behaviors. Uh, it, it's a, a wide-ranging look at uh, the health of the youth in the Needham school system. It tells us a lot, um, and you know, the people around this table, or these tables, rely on the data that's provided there to help make decisions and help target programs. One of the things that, that I'm interested in from this year's data is the difference in the perception of risk between uh, drunk driving and drug impaired driving. So in the 2014 administration, the fall 2014 survey administration, 81% of Needham high schoolers thought that drunk driving or being the passenger in a car with someone who had been drinking was a bad idea. But only 53% thought the same if that driver or themselves had been drug impaired. So the messages, both at a local, state, and federal level, about the dangers of drunk driving have really penetrated um, you know, the consciousness of today's youth. But there's a real difference between what they perceive as the risk of drunk driving and what they perceive as the risk of drug impaired driving. So that was one of the things that really stood out for me. One of the other things, and I think it's a, it's a tribute to a number of the, the school and uh, town departments, um, the students say uh, in the high 80s, say they have a trusted figure that they could go to at school that they would be comfortable sharing a problem with. And that's a protective factor, uh, which is really important when you think about uh, substance use or abuse, mental health conditions, or suicidal thoughts or actions. So having that protective factor in the Needham Public Schools is a real benefit. It, it, it helps protect our students from making those extreme decisions or feeling pressured into doing something that maybe they aren't sure they want to do. Uh, before we go any further, I, I know, John, that you know, your, your, your work working with these families on all of these issues that really you just talked about and that, that everyone around, uh, around the tables is, is uh, focused on. Um, we've been doing it for many years, and uh, you've seen the survey results too. Is there any takeaway that you can have from Well, there are a couple things to know. First of all, risk is a really important term, but we have to think of it from an adolescent point of view. The adolescent brain looks at risk differently. Uh, we used to think that they didn't see risk. Adolescents actually see risk, but they're more drawn to the reward. And actually, the person doing the risky behavior does not see that behavior as risky. So we have to understand that so you can see where the adult brain and the adolescent brain collide, because we see it very differently. Um, also, we have to really think about the interplay of technology, you know, in terms of access, kids knowing where to find drugs, uh, kids being up 24-7, kids waking up to check their phones, social media, the impact of reading everyone else's filter lives when you lead your own life unfiltered has a huge impact on all of these at-risk behaviors. Carol, what are some of the takeaways from uh, the, the Metro West survey result that, that your group and, and discussing and, and you've been talking about with, with parents and others? 
what what we have seen is that rates are decreasing locally, state, federally for alcohol, 30-day use and binge drinking, um, which is a good sign. Yet marijuana is, in our last 214 survey, uh, stayed quite stable, and that's concerning because in the focus groups we've done with youth, uh, they talk freely about the lack of perception of risk and harm with marijuana, and we are committed to look at that type of access point in public health, like we said, the risk and protective factors, educating youth and parents about the risk of harm with marijuana, um, and consistently reinforcing the risk of harm with alcohol and misuse of prescription drugs. So what, what adolescents will tell us is that um, the risk of certain substances in their perception um, has, needs to uh, be adjusted. We have the science and we have the data and young people are, are very um, smart and understand the science and want to hear that and that's part of the work that SALSA does and we appreciate that. Um, when you look at the youth survey, Yes, the numbers of students that are saying they're using substances is concerning, yet we look through the social norm lens and say the majority of Needham High School kids are not using substances in the last 30 days. So that's part of the work that we um, around this table are also trying to convey to parents because it's concerning and have our youth say that same thing. Well, and you know, I am hoping if we have time we can get into you know, some bit of a conversation. We're actually in a very interesting time right now because we have the governor just signed legislation two days ago about opioids um, and and some more screening in schools for, for students. And we have a ballot initiative about legalizing marijuana. And so we're in this weird this weird time right now where, where as a culture, I think, and as a larger community, we're struggling with what is the right thing to do. And, and young people, I think, from our perspective, are in the crux of that. And, and how do we, you know, how do we uh, help them and, and go through that? And what are the right things to do? It, it is, some of it's very troubling to me, and, and yet maybe there's an opportunity to, uh, to think about youth leadership uh, e even more strongly. Uh, Tom and, and uh, Kathy, both uh, your work, um, in the schools is, is pretty significant in, in thinking about uh, these substance abuse issues both for in the classroom and, and wellness and health <laughs> classes and also from, uh, from a guidance perspective in helping families and, and students. Uh, what are some of the things that, that uh, you're seeing, Tom, in, 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 the, in the school and then maybe Kathy, what are some of the things we're trying to do in, our, in, our, in the classroom to, sure. to mitigate some of these concerns? Sure. So w one of the, you know, there's a number of, of areas of concern that have already been mentioned. Uh, the one that, that I want to talk about is uh, mental health and substance abuse and that <coughs> one of the things that, that uh, we've been able to dig into the data and, and we're finding is, is that students who struggle with mental health issues uh, have a higher usage of, of both drugs and alcohol and so it's, it's while on, on one level students may be self-medicating in order to try to help themselves feel better when they're anxious or depressed, it also appears that it's, it's, it's making those, those conditions worse. Uh, so it's really uh, an important education piece for, for students to, to really understand that around mental health and about effective treatment is even though in the short run you may feel a little better or, or at least numb yourself so you're not feeling as distressed, that in the long run you're actually furthering uh, your difficulty in terms of a mental health issue. And that also goes, uh, you know, stress is also, you know, um, really correlated. You know, we looked at students who are experiencing very high levels of stress are also students who are reporting, you know, uh, higher levels of, of drug and alcohol use too. And so while something that you may be doing to try to help you with uh, an, an initial problem that you're having uh, in, in the long run just makes that problem worse and worse. And I think that's uh, a very, very important thing for, for all of us to be aware of and for certainly in the, the counseling and guidance to really help students see because it's, it's quite concerning. Well, and unfortunately, we're, frankly, we're in a culture where for, for, for generation at least, the solution was, you know, take this pill and things uh, will, will control your ADD 
or we will control your anxiety, or we will control this or that. And I, I, I hope we can eventually get to a place where it's not a matter of trying to control one's behavior, perhaps, but maybe acknowledge what one's abilities are and feelings are so that we can, we can use those, leverage those uh, to, to, to help with learning. I know I, I was happy to hear the other day that uh, more and more doctors are trying to prescribe exercise for their, their patients and, and not a, a painkiller or some prescription. Um, and then the problem in the cities is that there are fewer places to exercise, gyms for example. So, I mean, it'd be great if we had uh, an increase in the number of gyms available and, and running paths and, and less uh, yeah. uh, uh, jailhouses and, uh, uh, and other things. But maybe that's a, another discussion. Um, I, you know, the student perspective, I think, is, is pretty critical in this, Nicole and Mark. And I know you represent, uh, um, you know, your, your, your peers and, um, I, I guess I'd like to ask a little bit about what, uh, w what is your perspective, and we'll start with you, Mark, on, on what SALSA does and what you think the big issues are for, for this community. Well, mainly what SALSA does is, I mean, we do a wide variety of things. Um, one of them mainly being that we visit eighth grade health classes, we sit down with those kids, and we tell them ways to say no to drugs and alcohol, but we also kind of bring the realization to them that not everybody in the high school drinks or uses drugs because funny enough that's a lot of kids perceptions when they're in middle school so they get nervous going to high school thinking oh I, I won't be accepted unless I do one of these things and on top of it all we also just tell them what the high school's about so when we talk to the kids in the middle school it's not our, our main focus is ways to say no to alcohol and drugs but um, we also focus on other aspects of the high school clubs and whatnot. Um, but we also hold different events, like uh, Fifth Quarter's one we've been doing for a bit, where after home football games, kids have a place to go party and enjoy um, something to do after the game without having to worry about going to someone's house and being pressured to do something. So we do um, a few events like that. Uh, a coffee house, which we've done this year and the year before, where kids can go listen to live music, look at art, and have some snacks. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, I think it's really important to tear down that misconceptions um, the middle schooler have. But I think we should implement um, what we teach at a younger age because I feel like when they're in eighth grade, they already know what they want to do, what the choices they will make. And I've talked to my brother who's in seventh grade, and he was saying. Yes, like there's a lot of seventh graders who I heard are smoking, and that's really sad to hear. And I think that if we started at sixth grade, that would be a great start for them to see and enter it with a new view. Well, I, I know um, you talked about teaching. I want to ask Kathy in a moment I, I, uh, to, to talk about what, what's going on in the classroom. I know when I talk to parents, they parents whose oldest child is fifth grade or sixth grade, they on the one hand don't want to hear about this yeah. because they think it's you know later on in college or maybe senior year in high school they have to worry about but I think you're right on that that not that we have to frighten people because that's not I, I really like Mark how you said that we're trying to introduce them to what's going on at the high school all the great things because that's how you get connected and have a, a good time and and grow and learn and and, uh, uh, and, and, and develop a passion for something but I think uh, some parents need to be aware that, that it's a conversation with their child and, and using mm -hmm. young people like you to have a conversation with them is powerful and actually you're great role models. So I, I think we can start earlier than, than some parents probably would wish um, and, and also try to do it in a way that it's not frightening, which sounds like you're, you're not doing that. We'll get back to this, but I, Kathy, I, what's happening in the classroom? What, what, what are we trying to do? Because there's facts and information and conversation sure. teachers are having with students. So there's two approaches we take. One is knowledge and the other is skill, skill building. And um, we start with our health program in grade six. We go to seven, eight. Um, we start with tobacco. <clears throat> we move on to alcohol in seventh grade. Uh, we get into other drugs in eighth grade. Um, and then when we look at the high school, we go back to the data to see you know, where, where the use is happening. And there's a jump between 9 and 10 in use, and there's a jump between 11 and 12 in use. So we place our health classes prior to right, right in those spots. We have a ninth grade health class and a 10th grade health class that address 
a variety of the issues that have been brought up address decision making. So we talk a little bit about the teenage brain and how our kids need to take a little pause between the stimulus, do I want to do this, do I want to take this drug or have this drink, and their response to it. Um, we, we give them information. We introduce um, Alcohol EDU, which is an online educational program about alcohol, and my understanding is it will include marijuana next year. Um, this year it's sponsored this is by... This something that students do on their own in class? They do it in class. Okay. They do it in class. This year it was sponsored by the Newton Wellesley Hospital, which is which was um, a, a great a great thing to have. And next year we're going to um, be able to bring it into our own budget, so it'll continue on uh, for our kids. But it happens in class so that the kids can have the experience, but then have an opportunity with the teacher to process uh, the experience and the information that they receive. Um, throughout the whole health program, whether we're talking about substance use or relationships or any topic that kids have to make decisions about, um, we teach skills, so decision-making skills, um, how, to, how to analyze what consequences are going to be if they choose to do something. So it's a combination between content knowledge and skill building that we hope kids can go away with. Um, and and that, that's all that's happening um, pretty much, would you say, regarding substance um, curriculum, sixth grade? Are we... Six, we start with tobacco. Six and then up. Seventh, eighth, ninth, and eleventh. Okay. Where we really hone in on the topics. Um, I wanted to um, hear a little bit about some of the resources that we have available for families, John and, and Tom. But before that, I, it seems to me, uh, Tim, that this, this, uh, the news about opioids is, I mean, we're hearing it all the time. Um, it, 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 it's a problem. Um, what's happening locally in Needham with opioids? Is it is it are we immune from what's going on out in, in the community? Um, what? <laughs> Not quite. Um, so uh, opioids are a topic that are in the news. Um, you know, one of the things that, that <coughs> potentially is a misconception is that um, you know opioid addiction, uh, especially at the point where it might lead to overdose, um, is often but not always a result of heroin but most people who use heroin start with other drugs. Uh, and in many instances, people who uh, have a habit of misusing prescription drugs may have been prescribed medication for a, a very legitimate purpose after a surgery or an operation uh, and found themselves addicted and then resorted to a pattern of trying to steal them uh, from friends and loved ones. One of the things that Needham is very fortunate, both our police and fire department carry uh, nasal naloxone, which is known as Narcan, which is in opioid overdose reversal uh, medication. Um, there have been, and you're going to have to forgive me a little bit on the numbers, uh, nine in the last 12 to 18 months, uh, 18 months I think, uh, nine overdoses that have been reversed all successfully in need. By our public safety folks yes. who, who administered uh, Narcan. Yes, by either wow. police or fire. Wow. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a troubling number and, and for so people. Excuse me, and save, save their lives. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's a troubling number if you're in the community. It, it certainly um, speaks well to our public safety that they are both trained and equipped to respond in this way. One of the things that I think it is potentially a comfort uh, to parents of, of Needham school children is that the school nurses in the Needham public schools have been trained and each have a uh, nasal box on a Narcan kit. Um, whether that you know, would be used if, if a student potentially overdosed, which would obviously be uh, a terrible thing, but also there's a number of parents that are uh, on school grounds, there's uh, drivers who are delivering supplies, there's, there's a number of reasons why it's appropriate and it, it shows sort of how the community is trying to make sure there are resources uh, and techniques and training available all throughout the community. Um, so I think that's a, a positive thing um, that Needham has done proactively to try to address the concerns that people have about uh, opioids and, and the opioid epidemic. Um, and, I, and you know, the, the conversation <coughs> will unfold, um, so I guess I am weaving this in uh, about marijuana. And, I, you know, the, uh, when I think about the marijuana, and I'm not referring to the medical marijuana dispensary, kind of a different topic um, in, 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 uh, in many ways, um, maybe not entirely, but certainly a, a different topic and, cer and something this community is, is trying to administer and manage. But when I think about uh, um, recreational marijuana and um, the possibility of edibles and, and the things that little, 
you know, the children can get hold of it. It is concerning. Um, and I think there is some, some research out there saying that it, it does uh, do damage to a, a developing brain. And so we're going to have to really wrestle with that as a community and as a state as, as the next several um, months go on. Um, I wanted to ask you, John, you know, you all the time, families come in, uh, students come in or are referred to you who have some really uh, significant issues. And I know, Tom, you can comment on this as well in the schoolhouse. Um, how, how is the town prepared to assist families who, who are dealing with some of these Well, Needham issues? has a lot of resources, both within the school, Needham Youth Services, the Public Health Department, in the community. We have a phenomenal number of therapists in town. That said, the high school population is growing, so while statistically the percentages are decreasing in some areas, the actual numbers are increasing. You know, and adolescents are supposed to make mistakes. That's what it's all about. And some of those mistakes um, are fine and benign. And some of those mistakes are really painful, and some actually can take a life. Um, we know from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, close to 200 kids um, have self-injured. We know about 175 kids um, have seriously considered suicide. These are startling numbers, even for all of us who work with these all the time. So while the resources are great, the problems are more complicated, um, and keeping up keeping up with them is really hard. You know, we talk about building resilience in kids, that's great, but how can we make kids who are as young as fourth, fifth, sixth grade resilient to some of the challenges they have? And when they make a mistake, they feel really badly about themselves. And when they feel shameful, they're gonna be going to harmful behaviors. And I like to teach kids about self-generosity, like it's okay that you didn't do well in this paper. It's okay you didn't make this team. It's okay you're not the lead in the school place. So kids who can understand about self-generosity are happier and healthy kids, and happier and healthier kids involve themselves to lesser degrees in at-risk behaviors. Tom, in, in the schoolhouse, how do you direct some of the resources or help the counselors mm -hmm. decide um, Here's a, here's a student in need and, and, and this is how we'll respond or? <coughs> um, I mean, as John said, there's, you know, this, it's a, this is a, a very caring community and, and, as a, uh, and so we, we use youth services, contact, talk to Carol often about students who are struggling with substance abuse issues. Um, <coughs> within the schools, we, um, we spend a lot of time kind of meeting uh, with counselors around students that we're worried about, students with concern, devoting counseling sessions, resources to them, reaching out to parents. Um, <coughs> we're very fortunate in this town that we have, <coughs> through the uh, William James College, we have Interface, which uh, the uh, which is paid for by uh, Newton Wells, uh, the um, excuse me, uh, the deaconess in town, and also the uh, um, the. Um, Shapiro Foundation, which provides uh, mental health service uh, referrals to, to Needham families and, and Needham individuals. So we're <coughs> you really have to pay attention to this on, on many levels. Uh, there, there needs to be uh, kind of early detection and um, monitoring of how kids are doing. Counseling needs to be available, connecting with parents, education. Um, and <coughs> with all of us working together, we can uh, hopefully, uh, you know, head off um, both teach resiliency skills, but also head off some of the, the uh, possible more more tragic and provide services and, and treatment earlier uh, in the process. And it's really, you know, having students be as involved as they are um, <coughs> around substance abuse is very, very important. Um, a number of years ago, when I became director, we didn't have a student organization, and I think students were. Uh, really, really uncertain as to whether they could trust adults, whether they could work with adults around substance abuse and, and uh, uh, issues. I think there was a lot of concern about consequences and getting in trouble. And so it's very heartening to me to, to, to see students, more and more students coming forward and saying, we see this as a problem. Can we deal with this in a, in a kind of non-discipline, but a more treatment? Well, and it's a, in, a, in, a, in a proactive way that right. is really powerful. Carol, I just, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the actually a little bit of time that we have left, the, the Needham Coalition for Youth Substance Abuse Prevention has been supporting SALSA. And what are some of the other things this year that are going on with the coalition? As we hear here, this is an issue that's um, a community issue. We work with um, a commitment to 12 stakeholders in the community, school, youth, youth serving, parents, faith-based organizations, businesses, fraternal organizations, public health, police. So we work to break down the barriers 
between all of us as stakeholders to see what we can do to um, support youth and families. And we're doing uh, policy changes to basically impact access and availability to substances like Needham was so proactive in doing years ago with tobacco. So limiting access and availability to shift the community norm and to have people understand that this substance use um, traditionally has been a stigma for people to talk about. And we want to work to mitigate the stigma for mental health and substance abuse. That's the barrier often for youth and families to reach out and ask for help. So by getting the community together around the table through the coalition, um, we are breaking down those barriers and using what prevention science tells us can impact at the individual level and the family level, school and community. Well, it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful to have the community come together and I'm glad you mentioned the other, the fraternal organizations like Needham Exchange, the, the faith-based groups. I mean, it's, it's the community truly coming together and, and we're fortunate in Needham. Uh, Mark and Nicole, I'm going to have you end. We, we really have just a, a bit of time, but um, Mark and Nicole, I'm going to throw this at you. What else? And you're graduating this year, Mark. You have one more year with us, right? Yes, I do. Good. Um, <laughs> what, else do we, what else should we be thinking about, real quickly, um, as you think about your experience in Needham, Mark? What else do we need to be paying attention to regarding this topic? Um, you know, that's honestly a difficult question to answer. Um, I feel like there should be more, and we do this a lot, um, being able to listen to the students and whatnot, but I feel like if we allowed some students to be able to be those avenues of help to have like a student that kids could go to and be like, hey, here's what's going on, and that student could advocate for that person, mm. maybe make the interaction a little more um, comfortable for the student looking to be heard. Okay, so student advocacy, anything you would add to that? Um, I think we need to focus on the student's mental he health. There's many um, problems and many students have come up to me saying that they struggle with depression and anxiety and they thought that um, smoking weed would be the only way to help them, but they see that there's guidance counselors out here who will listen to them and they have more friends. and. Um, we need to focus and try to help out those students to show them that they should not be resorting to these harmful substances. Well, it sounds like empowering young people to really work with us to take charge of their lives is the message and the takeaway I've had. I appreciate uh, this conversation this morning and thank you very much for the, the really good work that's going on that the community is uh, supporting. Thanks.